everybody. Today the bookworms will continue reading Matilda by Roald Dahl and illustrated by Quentin Blake. Let's begin. Chapter 17, Miss Honey's Story. We mustn't hurry this, Miss Honey said. So let's have another cup of tea and do eat the other slice of bread. You must be hungry. Matilda took the second slice and started eating it slowly. The margarine wasn't at all bad. She doubted whether she could have told the difference if she hadn't known. Miss Honey, she said suddenly, do they pay you very badly at our school? Miss Honey looked up sharply. Not too badly, she said. I get about the same as the others. But it must still be very little if you are so dreadfully poor, Matilda said. Do all the teachers live like this with no furniture and no kitchen stove and no bathroom? No, they don't, Miss Honey said rather stiffly. I just happen to be the exception. I accept you just happen to be like living in a very simple way, Matilda said, probing a little further. It must make a house clean an awful lot easier and you don't have furniture to polish or any of those silly little ornaments lying around that have to be dusted every day. And I suppose if you don't have a fridge, you don't have to go out and buy all sort of junky things like eggs and mayonnaise and ice cream to fill it up with. It must have a terrific lot of shopping. At this point, Matilda noticed that Miss Honey's face had gone all tight and peculiar looking. Her whole body had become rigid. Her shoulders were hunched up high and her lips were pressed together tight. And she sat there gripping her mug of tea in both hands and staring down it as though searching for a way to answer these not quite so innocent questions. There followed a rather long and embarrassing silence. In the space of 30 seconds, the atmosphere in the tiny room had changed completely and now it was vibrating with awkwardness and secrets. Matilda said, I'm very sorry I asked you those questions, Miss Honey. It's not any of my business. At this, Miss Honey seemed to rouse herself. She gave a shake of her shoulders, and then very carefully she placed her mug on the tray. Why shouldn't you ask, she said. You are bound to ask in the end. You are much too bright not to have wondered. Perhaps I even wanted you to ask. Maybe this is why I invited you here after all. As a matter of fact, you are the first visitor to come to the cottage since I moved in two years ago. Matilda said nothing. She could feel the tension growing and growing in the room. You are so much wiser than your years, my dear, Miss Annie went on, that it quite staggers me. Although you look like a child, you are not really a child at all because your mind and your powers of sound reasoning seem to be fully grown up. So I suppose we might call you a grown-up child. If you see what I mean, Matilda still did not say anything. She was waiting for what's coming next. Up to now, Miss Honey went on. I have found it impossible to talk to anyone about my problems. I couldn't face the embarrassment. And in any way, I lacked the courage. Any courage I had was knocked out of me when I was young. But now, all of a sudden, I have a sort of desperate wish to tell you everything to somebody. I know you are the only a tiny little girl. There is some kind of magic in you somewhere. I've seen it with my own eyes. Matilda became very alert. The voice she was hearing was surely crying out for help. It must be. It had to be. Then the voice spoke again. Have some more tea, it said. I think there's still a drop left. Matilda nodded. Miss Honey poured tea into both mugs and added milk. Again, she cupped her own mug in both hands and sat there sipping. There was a quite a long silence before she said, May I tell you a story? Of course, Matilda said. I am 23 years old, Miss Honey said. And when I was born, my father was a doctor in this village. We had a nice old house, quite large, red brick. It's tucked away in the woods behind the hills. I don't think you'd know it. Matilda kept silent. I was born there, Miss Honey said. And then came the first tragedy. My mother died when I was two. My father, a busy doctor, had to have someone to run the house and to look after me. So he invited my mother's unmarried sister, my aunt, to come and live with us. She agreed and she came. Matilda was listening intently. How old was the aunt when she moved in, she asked. Not very old, Miss Honey said. I should say about 30. But I hated her right from the start. I missed my mother terribly. And the aunt was not a kind person. My father didn't know that because he was hardly ever around. But when he did put in an appearance, the aunt behaved differently. Miss Honey paused and sipped her tea. I can't think why I'm telling you all this, she said, embarrassed. Go on, Matilda said. Please. Well, Miss Honey said, 
Then came the second tragedy. When I was five, my father died very suddenly. One day he was there, and the next day he was gone. And so I was left to live alone with my aunt. She became my legal guardian. She had all the powers of a parent over me. And in some way or another, she became the actual owner of the house. How did your father die? Matilda asked. It is interesting you should ask that, Miss Honey said. I myself was much too young to question it at the time. But I found out later that there was a good deal of mystery surrounding his death. Didn't they know how he died? Matilda asked. Well, not exactly, Miss Honey said, hesitating. You see, no one could believe that he would ever have done it. He was such a very sane and sensible man. Done what? Matilda asked. Killed himself. Matilda was stunned. Did he? She gasped. That's what it looked like, Miss Honey said. But who knows? She shrugged and turned away and stared out of the tiny window. I know what you're thinking, Matilda said. You're thinking that the aunt killed him and made it look as though he'd done it himself. I'm not thinking anything, Miss Honey said. One must never think things like that without proof. The little room became quiet. Matilda noticed that the hands clasping the mug were trembling slightly. What happened after that, she asked. What happened when you were left alone with the aunt? Wasn't she nice to you? Nice, Miss Honey said. She was a demon. As soon as my father was out of the way, she became a holy terror. My life was a nightmare. What did she do to you? Matilda asked. I don't want to talk about it, Miss Honey said. It's too horrible. But in the end, I became so frightened of the her, I used to start shaking when she came into the room. You must understand I was a never strong character like you. I was always shy and retiring. Didn't you have any other relations? Matilda asked. Any uncles or aunts or grannies? Who would come and see you? None that I knew about, Miss Honey said. They were all either dead or they'd gone to Australia. And that's still the way it is now, I'm afraid. So you grew up in that house alone with your aunt, Matilda said. But you must have gone to school. Of course, Miss Honey said. I went to the same school as you're going to now. But I lived at home. Miss Honey paused and stared down into her empty tea mug. I think what I'm trying to explain to you, she said, is that over the years I became so completely cowed and dominated by this monster of an aunt that when she gave me an order, no matter what it was, I obeyed it instantly. That can happen, you know. And by the time I was ten, I had become her slave. I did all the housework. I made her bed. I washed and ironed for her. I did all the cooking. I learned how to do everything. But surely you could have complained to somebody, Matilda said. To whom? Miss Honey said. And anyway, I was far too terrified to complain. I told you, I was her slave. Did she beat you? Let's not go into details, Miss Honey said. How simply awful, Matilda said. Did you cry nearly all the time? Only when I was alone, Miss Honey said. I wasn't allowed to cry in front of her, but I lived in fear. What happened when you left school? Matilda asked. I was a bright pupil, Miss Honey said. I could easily have got into a university, but there was no question of that. Why not, Miss Honey? Because I was needed at home to do the work. Then how did you become a teacher, Matilda asked. There is a teacher's training college in reading, Miss Honey said. It's only 40 minutes bus ride away from here. I was allowed to go there on condition. I came straight home again every afternoon to do the washing and ironing and to clean the house and cook the supper. How old were you then, Matilda asked. When I went into teacher's training, I was 18, Miss Honey said. You could have just packed up and walked away, Matilda said. Not until I got a job, Miss Honey said. And don't forget, I was then dominated by my aunt to such an extent that I would to have dared. You can't imagine what it's like to be completely controlled like that by a very strong personality. It turns you to jelly. So that's it. That's the sad story of my life. Now I've talked enough. Please don't stop. Matilda said. You haven't finished yet. How did you manage to get away from her in the end and come and live in this funny little house? Ah, uh, that was something, Miss Honey said. I was proud of that. Tell me, Matilda said. Well, Miss Honey said, when I got my teacher's job, the aunt told me I owed her a lot of money. I asked her why. She said because I've been feeding you for all these years and buying your shoes and your clothes. She told me I added it up to thousands. 
and I had to pay her back by giving her my salary for the next ten years. I'll give you one pound a week pocket money, she said, but that's all you're going to get. She even arranged with the school authorities to make my salary pay directly into her own bank. She made me sign the paper. You shouldn't have done that, Matilda said. Your salary was your chance of freedom. I know, I know, Miss Honey said. But by then I had been her slave nearly all my life, and I hadn't the courage or the guts to say no. I was still petrified of her. She could still hurt me badly. So how did you manage to escape? Matilda asked. Ah,、uh, Miss Honey said, smiling for the first time. That was two years ago. It was my greatest triumph. Please tell me, Matilda said. I used to get up very early and go for walks while my aunt was still asleep. Miss Honey said. And one day I came across this tiny cottage. It was empty. I found out who owned it. It was a farmer. I went to see him. Farmers also get up very early. He was milking his cows. I asked him if I could rent his cottage. You can't live there, he cried. It's got no conveniences, no running water, no nothing. I want to live there, I said. I'm a romantic. I've fallen in love with it. Please rent it to me. You're mad, he said. But if you insist, you're welcome to it. The rent will be ten pence a week. Here's one month rent in advance. I said, giving him forty pence. And thank you so much. How super! Matilda cried. So suddenly you had a house all of your own. But how did you pluck up the courage to tell the aunt? That was tough, Miss Honey said. But I steeled myself to do it. One night after I had cooked her supper, I went upstairs and packed the few things I possessed in a cardboard box and came downstairs and announced I was leaving. I rented a house. I said. My aunt exploded. Renting a house? She shouted. How can you rent a house when you have only one pound a week in the world? I've done it. I said. And how are you going to buy food for yourself? I'll manage. I mumbled and rushed out of the front door. Oh, well done, you! Matilda cried. So you are free at last. I was free at last, Miss Honey said. I can't tell you how wonderful it was. But have you really managed to live here on one pound a week for two years? Matilda asked. I most certainly have, Miss Honey said. I pay ten pence rent, and the rest just about buys me a paraffin for my stove and for my lamp, and a little milk and tea and bread and margarine. That's all I really need. As I told you, I have a jolly good talking at the school lunch. Matilda stared at her. What a marvelously brave thing Miss Honey had done! Suddenly, she was a heroine in Matilda's eyes. Isn't it awfully cold in the winter? She asked. I've got my little paraffin stove, Miss Honey said. You'd be surprised how snug I can make it in here. Do you have a bed, Miss Honey? Well, not exactly, Miss Honey said, smiling again. But they say it's very healthy to sleep on a hard surface. All at once, Matilda was able to see the whole situation with absolute clarity. Miss Honey needed help. There was no way she could go on existing like this indefinitely. You would be a lot better off, Miss Honey, she said. If you gave up your job and drew in employment money, I would never do that," Miss Honey said. "I love teaching." This awful aunt," Matilda said. "I suppose she is still living in your lovely old house." "Very much so," Miss Honey said. "She's still only about fifty. She'll be around for a long time yet. And do you think your father really meant her to own the house forever?" "I'm quite sure he didn't," Miss Honey said. "Parents will often give a guardian." The right to occupy the house for a certain length of time, but it is nearly always left in trust for the child. It then becomes the child's property when he or she grows up. Then surely it is your house, Matilda said. My father's will was never found, Miss Honey said. It looks as though somebody destroyed it. No prizes for guessing who, Matilda said. No prizes, Miss Honey said. But if there is no will, Miss Honey, then surely the house goes automatically to you. You are the next of kin. I know I am, Miss Honey said. But my aunt produced a piece of paper, supposedly written by my father, saying that he leaves the house to his sister-in-law in return for her kindness in looking after me. I'm certain it's forgery, but no one can prove it. Couldn't you try? Matilda said. Couldn't you hire a good lawyer and make a fight of it? I don't have the money to do that, Miss Honey said. And you must remember that this aunt of mine is much respected figure in the community. She has a lot of influence. Who is she? Matilda asked. Miss Honey hesitated a moment, then she said softly, 
Miss Trunchbull. Chapter 18. The Names. Miss Trunchbull? Matilda cried, dropping about a foot in the air. You mean she is your aunt? She brought you up? No wonder you were terrified, Matilda cried. The other day we saw her grab a girl by the pigtails and throw her over the playground fence. You haven't seen anything, Miss Honey said. After my father died when I was five and a half, she used to make me bath myself all alone. And if she came up and thought I hadn't washed properly, she would push my head under the water and hold it there. But don't get me started on what she used to do. That won't help us at all. No, Matilda said, it won't. We came here, Miss Honey said, to talk about you. And I've been talking about nothing but myself the whole time. I feel like a fool. I am much more interested in just how much you can do with those amazing eyes of yours. I can move things, Matilda said. I know I can. I can push things over. How would you like it, Miss Honey said, if we made some very cautious experiments to see just how much you can move and push? Quite surprisingly, Matilda said, If you don't mind, Miss Honey, I think I would rather not. I want to go home now and think about all the things I've heard this afternoon. Miss Honey stood up at once. Of course, she said. I have kept you here far too long. Your mother will be starting to be worried. She never does that, Matilda said, smiling. But I would like to go home now, please, if you don't mind. Come along then, Miss Honey said. I'm sorry I gave you such a rotten tea. You didn't at all, Matilda said. I loved it. The two of them walked all the way to Matilda's house in complete silence. Miss Honey sensed that Matilda wanted it that way. The child seemed so lost, and when they reached the gate of Matilda's home, Miss Honey said, you had better forgot everything I told you this afternoon. I won't promise to do that, Matilda said, but I will promise not to talk about it to anyone anymore, not even to you. I think that would be wise, Miss Honey said. I won't promise to stop thinking about it, though, Miss Honey, Matilda said. I've been thinking about it all the way back from your cottage, and I believe I've just got a tiny little bit of an idea. You must not, Miss Honey said. Please forget it. I would like to ask you three last things before I stop talking about it, Matilda said. Please, will you answer them, Miss Honey? Miss Honey smiled. It was extraordinary, she told herself, how this little snippet of a girl seemed suddenly to be taking charge of her problems. And with such authority, too. Well, she said, that depends on what the questions are. The first thing is this, Matilda said. What did Miss Trenchbull call your father when they were around the house at home? I'm sure she called him Magnus, Miss Honey said. That was his first name. And what did your father call Miss Trenchbull? Her name is Agatha, Miss Honey said. That's what he would have called her. And lastly, Matilda said, what did your father and Miss Trenchbull call you around the house? They called me Jenny, Miss Honey said. Matilda pondered these answers very carefully. Let me make sure I've got them right, she said. In the house at home, your father was Magnus, Miss Trunchbull was Agatha, and you were Jenny. Am I right? That is correct, Miss Honey said. Thank you, Matilda said. And now I won't mention the subject any more. Miss Honey wondered what on earth was going on in the mind of this child. Don't do anything silly, she said. Matilda laughed and turned away and ran up the path to her front door, calling out as she went. Goodbye, Miss Honey. Thank you so much for the tea. Chapter 19. The Practice Matilda found the house empty as usual. Her father was not yet back from work, her mother was not yet back from bingo, and her brother might be anywhere. She went straight into the living room and opened the drawer of the sideboard where she knew her father kept a box of cigars. She took one out and carried it up to her bedroom and shut herself in. Now for the practice, she told herself. It's going to be tough, but I'm determined to do it. Her plan for helping Miss Honey was beginning to form beautifully in her mind. She had it now in almost every detail, but in the end it all depended upon her being able to do one very special thing with her eye power. She knew she wouldn't manage it right away, but she felt fairly confident that with a great deal of practice and effort, she would succeed in the end. The cigar was essential. It was perhaps a bit thicker than she would have liked, but the weight was about right. It would be fine for practicing with. There was a small dressing table in Matilda's bedroom with her hairbrush and comb on it and two library books. She cleared these things to one side and laid the cigar down in the middle of the dressing table. 
and she walked away and sat on the end of her bed. She was now about ten feet from the cigar. She settled herself and began to concentrate, and very quickly this time she felt the electricity beginning to flow inside her head, gathering itself behind the eyes. And the eyes became hot, and millions of tiny invisible hands began pushing out like sparks towards the cigar. Move, she whispered, and to her intense surprise, almost at once the cigar, with its little red and gold paper band around its middle, rolled away across the top of the dressing table and fell on the carpet. Matilda had enjoyed that; it was lovely doing it. It had felt as though sparks were going round and round inside her head and flashing out of her eyes. It had given her a sense of power that was almost ethereal, and how quick it had been this time! How simple! She crossed the bedroom and picked up the cigar and put it back on the table. Now for the difficult one, she thought. But if I have the power to push, then surely I also have the power to lift. It is vital I learn how to lift it. I must learn how to lift it right up into the air and keep it there. It is not a very heavy thing, a cigar. She sat on the end of the bed and started again. It was easy now to summon up the power behind her eyes. It was like pushing a trigger in the brain. Lift, she whispered. Lift, lift. At first, the cigar started to roll away, but then, with Matilda concentrating fiercely, one end of it slowly lifted up about an inch off the tabletop. With a colossal effort, she managed to hold it there for about ten seconds. Then it fell back again. Phew. She gasped. "I'm getting it. I'm starting to do it." For the next hour, Matilda kept practicing, and in the end, she had managed, by the sheer power of her eyes, to lift the whole cigar clear off the table about six inches, into the air, and hold it there for about a minute. Then suddenly, she was so exhausted she fell back on the bed and went to sleep. That was how her mother found her later in the evening. "What's the matter with you?" the mother said, waking her up. "Are you ill?" Oh gosh," Matilda said, sitting up and looking around. "No, I'm all right. I was a bit tired. That's all." From then on, every day after school, Matilda shut herself in her room and practiced with a cigar. And soon, it all began to come together in the most wonderful way. Six days later, by the following Wednesday evening, she was able not only to lift the cigar up into the air, but also to move it around exactly as she wished. It was beautiful. "I can do it!" she cried. I can really do it. I can pick the cigar up just with my eye power and push it and pull it in the air any way I want. All she had to do now was put her great plan into action. That's it for today. I hope you guys enjoy. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for more read-alongs. Until next time, bye.